Hello, everybody, and welcome to our Missouri Prairie Foundation webinar, The Soil Microbiome is the Basis for Soil Health, with Dr. Bob Kremer. Uh, my name is Brooke Widmar. I'm the Director of Administrative Operations and Member Engagement for the Foundation, and I want to thank all of you for joining us for this webinar today. Uh, during the webinar, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A section. Uh, on your screen. And at the end, Carol will come back to read those out to Bob. Uh, this webinar is being recorded. A link will be shared with all of you tomorrow, along with any resources mentioned during the presentation and during the Q&A section. So to introduce today's speaker, uh, Bob currently serves as an adjunct professor of soil microbiology in the School of Natural Resources and the Division of Plant Sciences at the University of Missouri. And he recently retired after a 32 year career as a microbiologist with the USDA Agricultural Resource Service. Dr. Kremer has an extensive soil research background, is a certified soil scientist, is an, uh, he's active in numerous professional societies, has published numerous articles, including two books, and has served on advisory panels for uh, the US EPA and NRCS. He was raised on a diversified farm in Osage County uh, here in Missouri and continues to work and carry out field research trials on the same farm. So without further ado, take it away, Bob. Okay, thank you, Brooke. Um, it's, it's my pleasure to be here today because um, as, as Brooke mentioned, after uh, many years in the uh, USDA, I, I, I got into uh, doing some uh, research on prairies, which was a considerable delightful change from the monotony of corn and soybean uh, fields. And I've continued to do that to this day. And I appreciate the Prairie Foundation and Carol in particular in supporting uh, our efforts on that. So talking about the uh, soil microbiome um, in, in prairies as a basis for soil health, we just, we, we, can, get, we can get right into, um, let's see, I gotta advance this, okay. Um, get, in, get into the basis of, of this is understanding the uh, different types of microorganisms in general. And about 30 years ago, there was a revolution in molecular uh, biology that split these organisms into what we call domains today. And we have these uh, prokaryotes, which are the single cell organisms without uh, um, distinctive organelles in, in the cells. The bacteria was split into bacteria and archaea. Archaea are those so-called ancient bacteria that you find in uh, or prokaryotes that you find in extreme conditions, such as the uh, thermal pools at Yellowstone or, or at, the, it, at the depths in the ocean. They, they, they have a different wall structure than bacteria. But the thing I want to point out is with bacteria and archaea, they are the most versatile group that we have on Earth. They, as I mentioned, they function in extreme environments and under extreme conditions. They are the only ones that can mediate vital several vital processes such as all the, ne nearly all the nitrogen transformation such as nitrogen fixation and they are the only ones that are able to live without oxygen on the other hand we have the eukarya and the eukaryotes that we'll be uh, touching on today are the fungi algae protist nematodes etc all the way up to the earthworms they're very important but they do exist under limited environmental conditions they are all aerobic. In other words, they all uh, must have oxygen to live, and, but some of them have specific enzymes for unique uh, metabolism, such as lignin degradation in plant materials is primarily mediated only by certain fungi. So a little bit of uh, text here, just some definitions that things that I will be talking about during this uh, seminar or webinar include, you know, what is the microbiome? It's, it's basically the entire microbial community within a habitat. In this case, it would be soil, the rhizosphere, which is the root zone, and within plants as well. The microhabitat are these space, spaces or niches that is favorable for microbial growth. We'll be talking about soil aggregates, which is an arrangement of the soil into particles. A lot about biodiversity, which is a variation at all levels of biological organization. Um, from, the, from the genes to, to the full communities of, of the different populations of these. And I'll talk a little bit about the different uh, diversities. There's taxonomic, which is structural based on classification, what I would say who is who. 
and functional diversity, which is the occurrence of physiological and metabolic traits among members of a microbial com community. In other words, what do they do? Do they, do they decompose cellulose? Do they fix nitrogen? This kind of thing. And there are genes for those processes. Um, a little bit about redundancy, which, which is very unique for microbes, especially if there's a magnitude of different groups that have different metabolic capability or the same metabolic ca capability, there's always some that can step up under a stressful situation and carry that on. It's very important in a diverse environment. And then I want to finally say, you know, this, this all leads to soil health. And I think there may be some, a webinar or two later on uh, this year on that. I just want to give you my definition of soil health. It's not only just the, fun the, the capacity of soil to function, but it is the living, it is the living dynamic nature of soil that functions by incorporating the biological attributes of biodiversity, food web structure, ecosystem functioning, and the intimate relationships of soil microorganisms with plants and animals. So the, 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 the two critical components for soil biology and ultimately soil health is of course, the soil uh, micro di microbial diversity, which is the distribution and relative abundance of these components and soil carbon content and quality. Very important because soil carbon drives the met metabolism in the soil for almost all the microbes, except for those that can live off of carbon dioxide or, or certain minerals. So it is very important that you have these two components in the soil in order to have a good functioning soil that supports the vegetation on the landscape. So here we have, I'm showing uh, a reconstructed prairie. These plants provide the carbon, not only carbon, but also, also nitrogen and also their roots uh, contribute to structure of soils. And then if we look at, at a micrograph of a plant root surface, you see this, this is where most of these microbes um, reside is on the surface of plant roots because that is the most um, uh, beneficial environment in the soil. It's where these carbon compounds are coming out the root surface. These, this shows bacteria, small rods that are colonizing the root surface, the plane of the root surface. In often biofilms, which are polysaccharides that the microbes produce to stick onto the roots. And the plant is exuding carbon in on there, the, the, the microbes are getting benefits for that, but they are also producing nutrients for the and growth regulators that, for the plant. So it's a very intimate relationship um, between the plants and the microbes. And this just gives you, gives you a, an idea. It's not a very good picture, but you know, this is the transformation of solar energy to available carbon through photosynthesis. And if you see at the, at the, uh, at the, uh, tips of these roots, there's some uh, droplets. Those are, that is the plant sap that contains this rich, rich available carbon that goes directly into the soil. And the microbes will take up about, you know, maybe up to 40% of the carbon that's fixed by these plants released into the soil. And that's what keeps them um, going and being productive. Okay, so we can look at the um, microorganisms in the soil in a few different ways by th their size and their, and their biomass. This is a very simple diagram just to show, um, you know, how numbers increase as you go down the triangle as bi and biomass increases at the top. Obviously, the higher biomass type organisms such as the microfauna as earthworms and soil insects have bi high biomass, but they have low numbers. Uh, mesofauna such as the uh, mites and the uh, microarthropods are, are, are next. And then you have the, what's called the microfauna, protozoa, nematodes, these sorts of organisms. And then we get into this layer here, which is the microflora. This is the really the workhorses in the soil. These are the, are the actual microorganisms, the bacteria and the fungi that carry out many of the transformations in the soil. But then at the base here, really don't want to forget about the viruses. There are, yes, indeed, there are viruses in the soil. We call them phages. Nearly every bacteria and fungus may be infected with these. Uh, don't worry, they're not, uh, they're not infective to humans, but they do control 
um, the uh, microorganisms in the soil. Uh, and also they are a natural nanoparticle. In other words, they're about a billionth of a meter or more, and they can transfer genetic material from one microbe to another. And this has been uh, a, a lot of the way the, the genetic biotechnology is based on the way viruses can incorporate genetic material from one bacteria, then infect another one and, and incorporate that DNA into it. Uh, the, what, the other uh, component I don't want to forget are the terrestrial arthropods. There may be about 250,000 pounds per acre of ground beetles and other arthropods on the surface of the soil that can be very important in, in uh, dispersing soil microorganisms. So this just gives you an idea of some of the sizes. You know, we're, we're talking in micro terms for viruses. It's in nano terms. This is uh, 200, about 20 um, nanometers, which is a billionth of a meter. And their numbers reach up to 100, uh, 100 trillion uh, per gram of soil. Bacteria, but they don't have a lot of biomass. Bacteria, on the other hand, bacteria and actinos, which are both in the bacterial domain, will reach up to about a billion, anywhere from a million to a billion uh, per, per uh, gram of soil. Their sizes are in the micrometers here, microns, and their biomass is up to 3,000 kilograms per hectare, which is about 2,500 pounds per acre. So when you hear some people say, you know, in the soil, you, you ought to be paying attention because you've got about, you know, you got so many cows per acre beneath the soil, you know, it, it's really true when you look at the biomass of these microorganisms. Uh, fungi are, are, are larger, a little bit lower in biomass, and you have the protozoa and nematodes, earthworms, up to a thousand, about uh, 800 pounds per acre of uh, earthworm biomass. These are some of the other creatures that we'll find in the soil. Here, here are the nematodes. You have these very small uh, uh, crustaceans and, and arthropods, such as the, the water bears or the tardigrades. Here are the calimbolas that you find in compost piles, different types of worms, uh, millipedes, uh, termites, earthworms, all very important in the overall scheme of the interactions of the biology in the soil, which I will show you in a bit in the soil food web, which is right here. So the soil food web is very important because they are essential for economic or environmental functioning and economic services. And so in this particular case, what do you see in the center is a plant. And a plant is, has the roots in the soil and it is, it is functioning by bringing in organic substances into the soil. And that first level here, you, we have bacteria and fungi that begin living off of this. They, they, and as they do that, they uh, process this material. And remember, their life cycle is probably 48 hours or even less. So as they fix that carbon, they, they die off and then they are, they are recycled into soil carbon and nitrogen, very high nitrogen content in these. In these. And that help us, that what helps that along is the interaction with the, the phages that can control their population. But also when you get out here with, uh, with amoeba or protozoa and nematodes, they will feed on these and release nitrogen into the soil for uptake by the plants. And then further on out in that food web, you have these larger organisms that pre-process the organic matter for um, uh, eventual mineralization of carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur by this first trophic level that contains the bacteria and the fungi. So it's a very intricate um, situation. It's why it's called a food web because of all these interactions rather than a food chain. And many of these organisms out here not only uh, process the organic matter, but they're also known as ecosystem engineers. So they're, they're providing soil structure, poor space for good aeration and, and water movement in the soil. So if we take a look at that, what, what the soil food web, let's say in a hypothetical block of prairie soil, as you see here, here would be something like this. You'd have these microorganisms occupying certain niches within the soil that are, that are provided by the different uh, other macroorganisms and the prairie grass here that are 
deeply rooted and bringing carbon substrates for the organisms to work that are then uh, mineralizing nutrients into an available form for uptake by the grasses. What is happening also is you have these other large uh, animals within the soil that also help with the uh, structure and water infiltration and aeration. So this is a, kind of a, a look at a high, what might happen in a, a three-dimensional block of prairie soil. So we'll be looking at the plant associated microbiome because th really this is where the action is. And, you know, the, the uh, microbiome that is associated with the plant roots metabolizes this carbon. They synthesize plant growth, root subs plant growth substances that are very, for instance, stimulate root growth. Uh, they, they produce antibiotics to suppress pathogens and uh, contribute to the soil structure. And again, here are some of these bacteria that are on the surface, we call these rhizobacteria, but we don't want to forget that there are a lot of bacteria that are actually within root cells or within plant tissue, which we call endophytes. And that's what you can see here in this particular micrograph where the cells, the bacteria are staying green and they are for the large, most part beneficial to the, to the plant, producing all these substances that are, that are effective for plant growth. One of the unusual or unique events that has been uh, described recently is this, is this situation where plant roots are, have been found to actually take up intact bacteria by the, at the root tip, goes into the root, and at this point, the plant actually extracts nutrients from the bacteria for plant use, and then that bacteria Re, re, is revived, it's viable, and it's released from the root hairs back into the soil and begin the cycle again. It's called rhizophagy. In other words, it's uh, root eating. And uh, there is a claim by weight at Rutgers University that, that says that a lot of this is happening. It's just something that's just been discovered within the last two years. But I think it's something that's important to mention, uh, just to be aware of that the, a lot of this may be happening, especially in perennial systems such as grasslands. Um, I did mention the terrestrial insects, arthropods. Uh, let's not forget that they can take up bacteria, algae, uh, fungi in their gut, much of the same way that we have uh, a gut microbiome. And it helps these or these uh, organisms to digest the organic matter that they eat uh, on the soil surface and then uh, release the processed material because without the microbes, they wouldn't be able to take advantage as much like the termites that have the uh, certain bacteria and fungi in their system. So it is a very key ecological process. It's, it's one of these situations known as a functional integration of, of symbiotic microorganisms from the soil. So when we're, when we're um, considering the soil microbiome and in the soil uh, environment, we've got to remember that those microorganisms are interacting with the other components of soil, the physical properties, the, the sand, silt, and clay, the, chemist, the chemicals in the soil for transformation into usable nutrients, obviously the biological, and the, the key uh, component here that is uh, produced by the biological component is organic matter. And organic matter or organic carbon affects all properties of soil, physical and chemical. So the location of these components will depend on the properties of the soil type. So, you know, if it's a sandy soil, it may be a different situation than in, in those soils that are heavier in silts and clays. And of course, environmental conditions. It, one could just look up the soil uh, factors of soil formation by Hans Jenny back in 1941. Everything that he mentions in there, uh, parent material, uh, vegetation, climate, affects how these microorganisms interact with the soil. And if you look at the soil regions of Missouri and, and where a lot of the prairies exist, for instance, in the southwest part of the state, is completely different soils than in where I am in Columbia here. 
uh, where we have this uh, central clay pan uh, series, that's going to uh, determine or have an effect on the type of microorganisms and their functions in these prairies that are located on these different soils. You go up to the northwestern part of the state, you have these deep lus soils that has, have more timber than what you would find in the prairies in the southwest. All these factors will affect uh, the type of microbiome that is associated uh, with the prairie grasses. And I've got some data to show that uh, a little bit later. So this just is a, a little schematic that, that kind of outlines those factors, you know, the biotic factors, plants, grazers, um, human activities, the prairie, if the prairie's been grazed or, or, or used for hay before, abiotic factors, uh, the climate, the, the uh, texture of the soil, um, root exudates, different uh, plants have different root exudates, will uh, select different types of microorganisms and the rhizosphere interactions, whether there's uh, pathogens or are there growth regulators being synthesized by some of those rhizobacteria. And uh, also stress tolerance is very important. A good diverse microbiome will, will help plants overcome or at least tolerate different stresses during the year. Uh, so how are these microbes, uh, dis the microbiome distributed? This is a little study that was done about 10 years ago on um, Midwest tall grass prairies using some new uh, genomics techniques. And, and they mapped out uh, the diversity of, this, of, the, of these prairie soils. And you can see going from red to uh, blue, blue uh, there is a lot of difference in, in the diversity distribution in these, in these tall grass prairie soils. Down here is a little bit higher diversity. Here in Missouri, it was, it was a bit lower. But when I go back and read the paper, he only took about five samples in Missouri, and they're using a lot of computational techniques to predict what would be there. Uh, in this part of the Midwest, um, Missouri, Illinois, there's quite a bit of diversity. Now that's taxonomic diversity. In other words, he could, this, these researchers could pull out the different families and, uh, and uh, uh, um, phyla based on the gene for those types of, of organisms. They also did what's called the, the functional gene diversity. In other words, genes for certain uh, processes, uh, carbon decomposition, nitrogen fixation, um, uh, oxidation reduction of manganese, and these sorts of things. They took those genes and then looked at, looked at what, the, what was there, and they, they find a little bit more uh, functional diversity on either end of this uh, north-south stretch of the tall grass prairies. Uh, and what's interesting in, in these prairies, the, the highest correlation between a taxonomic group and a functional group was a group that was able to um, degrade a lot of organic material to produce uh, uh, different carbon compounds. So, which makes sense. You have a lot of organic matter in prairies, therefore you're going to have a lot of uh, specialists that are going to break down the, the, the uh, organic residues and form uh, soil organic carbon. So, and when you look at the, the root system of a, of a prairie plant in the soil, it, these are roots of prairie grass. I think this was Indian grass that we have on Bradford Farm here, uh, just east of Columbia in a soil profile. You see this is 60, uh, 60 centimeters, which is about three feet or so um, depth into the soil. Um, there's a lot more carbon substrates being released by these roots at depth in the soil compared to a corn plant that, is, that was planted maybe 20 feet down, down the landscape from the, the prairie grass. So this, this just gives an example of how the microbiome can be stimulated by this massive network of, of prairie grass roots come to corn, which compared to corn, which is not rooting very deeply because this is a particular soil that has a lot of clay at this level here. You can see the kind of the whitish layer here. Those roots are just not penetrating it, penetrating it as these prairie grass roots are. You know, one of the reasons why corn is grown on such a landscape here, it has to be fed a lot of synthetic fertilizers uh, as, a pair, as compared to the prairie grass, which is getting a lot of its nutrients from the biology of the soil. So 
a hypothetical soil habitat then, where would you find these organisms within the soil? Um, here is your soil aggregate, uh, sand, silt, and clay, um, organic material being produced here. The small microflora, the bacteria and the fungi would be found in these very uh, uh, crevices or intersections here of, of these soil particles in the aggregate. And also notice what else you have here are water films. Microorganisms, microorganisms are basically aquatic organisms, so they need to have a water film uh, nearby in order to function, in order to take up that carbon substrate from the plants. Here you have the predator of the, of the mite in, the, in a bigger niche up here. Uh, the mycorrhizae are very important uh, for uh, exploring the soil volume to take up phosphorus and other minerals and water for the plant. Uh, also, there's fungal hyphae up here that help bind the aggregate together. The nematodes and protozoa are down here to help control the bacterial and fungal population. So this is a very hypothetical uh, 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 aggregate. It has pore spaces, you will see, but it does provide a very good habitat for these microorganisms. <clears throat> if you look at the, the rhizosphere, gives you another example of where these microorganisms would be located within, within a prairie ecosystem. It kind of gives you an idea of how the diversity is decreased the further away you get from the rhizosphere or from the root. Uh, up here, you have a lot more bacteria. You have the mycorrhizae, fungi. You have some uh, protozoa and nematodes in this zone here. Very high diversity, very great functionality at this point uh, where much nutrients can be transferred to the plant. Uh, these organisms can also produce antibiotics to keep pathogens uh, suppressed. And so you can see down here at this graph, you know, there's greater numbers of, or abundance of these microbes are closer to the root. And as you further, as you get away, they decrease. So the function, we talked a lot, we just looked a, a lot at uh, the taxonomic diversity. What, what, are, what are the functions of a healthy, fully active soil food web? Well, we mentioned the chemical engineers, which regulate 90% of the energy flow to stimulate uh, plant growth. They make antibiotics, and these are the bacteria and fungi. So most of the nutrient transformation is, taking, is, is uh, mediated by this group of microorganisms. We have the regulators that we mentioned. Uh, these are the protozoa, the nematodes, a lot of the worms, the springtails, the mites. And then we have the ecosystem engineers, which help form the porosity and structures and aid and aggregation. Um, they can transport these particles around. And these include not the plant roots, the earthworms, millipedes, and other uh, insect, um, soil-borne insects. Keeping with the function, one of the main functions that you probably have gathered by now is the soil organic matter uh, uh, production, formation. And high microbial diversity is critical to doing this. And, and what happens here, and this kind of gives you <clears throat> how the different groups of microorganisms are involved in taking plant residues that we see, that we see here and degrading them through a cycle using bacteria, actinobacteria, which are thread-like bacteria, which is also a, one of the main sources of many of our antibiotics these days. Uh, the fungi eventually getting to what we call soil organic, gives you that rich black uh, substance in soils that really keep the soil together and provides that habitat for the microbes and um, absorption of minerals and, and uh, uh, many other functions. So what this is, this is where this um, redundancy comes in. We have many microbes that can do these, but, but, but different microbes are involved at different steps, beginning with the plant residues. Remember the lignin breakdown takes fungi, uh, later on cellulose by broke, broken down by bacteria and other fungi. And uh, it goes on down to preparing the soil organic matter. So this is what we call, the involvement of microbial consortia. In other words, many different groups that are working together to achieve the final product of a particular process. One of the other things I wanna point out is there's a production of carbon dioxide, that this is an aerobic process. So um, 
in things like the, the constant replenishment of systems with organic matter, such as in a prairie system, continues the decomposition process uh, year to year. Now, the breakdown of the, of the organic matter will give you the, you know, you go from fresh residue and you get this active fraction that is material that is in process. It's not completely made in the organic matter, but it's very important in, in uh, aggregate formation and sustaining the, the biological um, uh, activity. And then we, then the portion of it goes into stabilized organic matter, which we call humus, that is responsible for the um, uh, uh, aeration, water, water absorption, can sorb different minerals and even synthetic chemicals uh, over time. And then microorganisms may take up 5% of that total organic matter. So that organic matter can be built up using a prairie, uh, a prairie management situation. Here is a graph that, that we tracked over the last, we're still tracking it really or since, since uh, 2000 or before, of the buildup of organic matter in a reconstructed prairie on a very uh, degraded landscape in Clay County, Missouri. Um, and what's, what was key to this in building up the organic matter was the persistent restoration efforts uh, to get these prairie plants established over time and then maintain. And what we can see is it went from below almost 2% 2 organic matter or below to uh, about 6% in 15 years, that's a, that's a buildup of about 0.25% soil organic matter annually, which indicates there's a good uh, active uh, micro microbiome there and the soil is being improved, soil health is being improved uh, consistently as time moves on. Another function uh, that the microbiome provides is through the mycorrhizae, which you all are probably already familiar with. Uh, symbiotic type of fungi that infect the roots. Uh, they populate the, the soil with their spores that can be uh, used on new plants that are emerging. Uh, you see these structures that infect the roots that will exchange water and nutrients from the soil for carbon from the plant for the uh, mycorrhizae. And you know, most of the native species depend on arbuscular mycorrhizae. This is what the arbuscules are for this particular type of uh, mycorrhizae, especially in soils with phosphorus and other nutrient limitations that the plants cannot take, off, take up, and often subject to water and other stresses and root pathogens. <clears throat> the mycorrhizae can also produce antibiotics to help um, suppress any root infections or root diseases. <clears throat> Sorry. So how would, a diverse, um, how would a diverse microbial community function at the ecosystem scale? This is a nice little, it looks busy, but it's a nice little graphic that shows how the soil microbiome bridges functionality between soil properties and plant growth. So you can see the, mic the microbiome produces a lot of gums and, and polysaccharides that help stick particles together, that help with the... Uh, Ag aggregates, in other words, on the, the physical components of soil uh, producing organic matter, but they also will um, release nutrients such as the nitrogen, su the sulfates and the phosphorus that are in the soil making it very fertile, which are also available for plant uptake. Over here, the plant growth is influenced not only by the nutrient cycling, but by plant growth promotion through many different plant growth regulators, um, synthesis of compounds that chelate these compounds out of the soil and make it available to the plant. So you see there's kind of a closed loop here that where a, a very diverse micro, microbiome that has um, uh, important aspects for all components in the soil. So I wanted to show a little bit about uh, the, the different types of microbes that we find in some of these Missouri, pra uh, Missouri prairies. Uh, we looked at uh, uh, Tucker Prairie, which is a, a native prairie. We looked at, uh, this is uh, uh, the, a, a burn portion. We've also taken soils from a reconstructed prairie. I believe this is out at Prairie Fork. And we compared that to a conventionally tilled agroecosystem, basically a field of corn that's been that's been tilled. And we looked at the microbiome in there. And so what you see here, Tucker Prairie 
with the total PLFA, that is the total microbial uh, uh, biomass in that soil is much higher, either whether it's burned or not, as you see here, it's still much higher than reconstructed uh, prairie, but although that is still higher than the cultivated site, which its microbiome is, is uh, pretty well uh, damaged or degraded, it's, its redundancy and its diversity is probably down quite a bit, which we can see here. If we look at, this is a bar graph of fungi, um, the, the, the two prairies, Tucker and the reconstructing, have a very uh, high abundance of fungi. The cultivated is at about 50%. The same as can be said for down here and the mycorrhizae is very similar to the total fungi. Mycorrhizae is even lower in the cultivated. And one of the bacterial groups is very high in tucker. Uh, there may be some situation where it needs to be better uh, microhabitats in the reconstructed soil at Prairie Fork but it's still higher than the cultivated soil. So it just shows you that, uh, you know, with the uh, situation with a grassland, a prairie situation, the soil microbiome is in, is in very much better shape than what, what happens after poor management with intensive, with intensive, uh, uh, with intensive uh, management. Um, I'm sorry. I can't believe that I'm missing something here. Um, well, I had some other, I must have a different uh, file. Um, <laughs> let's see. Uh, uh, bear with me for a minute. No, you know what? I, I guess that's um, I guess that's all I have. Um, let me let me go through that summary slide real quick, real quick. Um, if I can get back to Zoom. Bob, you're still you're still in Zoom, so you're okay. Just um, go back to playing your your slideshow. Right. Okay. Okay. Here we go. Uh, uh, sorry about that. Um, so, Thank you. <laughs> um, let no me problem. Back. Let me go back. So these are the, uh, you know, some of the systems I wanted to talk about. Uh, let me let me finish with um, uh, with the uh, some what I would call thoughts on prairie ecosystems and the soil microbiome. Uh, we see that the high, a high microbial diversity in prairie allows the ecosystem functioning with a closed system. In other words, um, all the, the nutrient cycling, the uh, decomposition, uh, carbon, uh, uh, carbon cycling is, is maintained within the ecosystem without any uh, ex external inputs. And uh, that helps maintain um, uh, plant productivity, um, as well as a native arthropod and wildlife communities, as well as soil health. You know, we, if we look at the, the prairie soil microbiome, and, and this is an example from some old work, oh, it, uh, 30 years ago on Tucker Prairie with uh, uh, the, my soil microbiology predecessors, George Wagner and Boyanoska, who was working with Claire Cassera at the time, who, who was curator of Tucker Prairie. They looked at a lot of carbon dynamics out there. And what they found was that 43% of the annual production of the vegetation, both above and below ground of the uh, prairie system contributed to the soil organic pool compared to only 20% of that for wheat. So that suggests that these prairie systems are very good at carbon sequ sequestration contribution or carbon storage and uh, are a very good way uh, to keep you know, when we're talking about carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and how we can kind of manage that, uh, the more prairies we have, sorry, the more prairies we have, uh, the better uh, potential for carbon 
uh, storage is, is, is possible. That diverse soil microbiome can also mitigate the greenhouse gas emissions from prairie, not only through mitigating carbon dioxide through carbon uh, storage, but because the nitrogen cycles are in sync with each other, the whole issue of nitrous oxide evolution is, is kept in balance and, and the greenhouse gas emissions are quite, quite a bit lower. This diverse soil microbiome may allow more tolerance to stress. Um, however, you know, we, if, if climate change is really ongoing and is, is going to increase if nothing is done, uh, how, you know, how can it handle the extremes of the severity and the duration of these stresses uh, for the plants. So, um, you know, we want to know what are what what might be the effects of ongoing climate change. There's a lot of work that needs to be done with that. Um, temperature fluctuations, changing precipitation patterns, uh, that should be an M, may affect microbial diversity in rhizosphere and the phylosphere. Didn't get to talk too much about the phylosphere. That is the uh, um, microbiome that, uh, that are on the leaves of these plants that are very important for again, for plant growth. But again, with climate uh, warming or climate change, if, uh, if it continues uh, these fluctuations and especially the changing precipitation patterns, especially what we've seen this year, uh, this has to have an effect on the soil microbiome and, and they're going to have to adapt to those conditions if it continues. Uh, invasive plant species can change or cause imbalance of the soil microbiome. We've done a, a fairly good study on uh, uh, Cerisa lespedisa, and we found that um, soil under Cerisa lespedisa is, is completely um, changed in terms of the balance of the different components of the microorganisms in the soil uh, relative to a prairie system. And this has, um, this has implications for prairie reconstruction reconstruction and restoration because it's going to take a while for those uh, uh, microbiomes to rebound to the uh, original uh, level of uh, diversity that it was before uh, we had these invas invasive spots. Um, exposure of prairie to more grazing could benefit the soil microbiome and soil health. We, we've seen this in pasture situations with cattle. You know, perhaps uh, the prairies that are under grazing management with the bison um, may have uh, a lot, uh, a more robust uh, soil microbiome. Um, uh, I'm sure there's some work going on with that, but grazing does, the integration in with the grasslands can help that. And uh, finally, sorry, the maintenance of beneficial arthropods, I don't know why it's doing that, um, including pollinators will aid in soil and plant microbial diversity. I think I showed you that with that uh, um, intra-functional um, uh, schematic with the symbiotic microorganisms with that particular terrestrial insect. So it, I think what it shows you is that all these different ecosystem components kind of interact together and makes this uh, prairie ecosystem very unique and something that we can benefit from um, in our, um, even in our agronomic production for uh, food production. So with that, I will stop. I, I, I hope I gave you the full um, file that I had. Um, and I, I'm so, I apologize for some of the disruption there, but I will take any questions uh, that you may have. Bob, this, this is Carol David, uh, Director of Prairie, the Missouri Prairie Foundation. And Bob, thank you very much for a wonderful presentation your uh, information and the graphics really help take an extremely complex topic and make it more understandable. So thank you very much. Um, we do have a number of questions and I'll just start in with them. Um, Greg asks, I burn my 18 acres of tall grass prairie here in Ohio annually. You mentioned the importance of carbon. Am I helping with my burning? Well, um as you as you saw with the one uh, shot of the, the the prairie that we that we studied um, Tucker and we've looked at other uh, prairies as well I just didn't show them that had had uh, both uh, um, non-treated and 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 controlled burns 
Uh, we didn't, you know, we we expected to see some effect with burning on uh, on the carbon in the soil as well as the microbial activity, uh, but but we really didn't. Um, it was kind of a surprise. And and again, this is you know this is Missouri systems. I we got a little bit different soils and uh, and some of the environments, but the fact that we looked at Southwest Missouri versus Mid Missouri. Uh, which are have very contrasting soils and burning. Um, I would say, uh, you know, your burning management would be uh, would be fine. I, I don't think you're harming anything. Uh, in fact, the the other uh, I should say the other site that we looked at on the the uh, reconstructed uh, prairie site where I showed you the increase in organic matter over a 15 year period, uh, that one is burned uh, periodically as well. And we haven't really seen a big difference. So I think you're okay with your management. Um, and uh, you know, other than timing and all that, I really couldn't give you any, any more information if that's gonna make any difference or not. But that's, that's, that's the extent of what we found to this point. Thank you. Some other questions about um, the soil mi microbiome in our yards and under turf grass. If um, someone is, is routinely using insecticides or herbicides as a matter of course, you know, frequently in a, in a turf grass situation, um, what do we know about the effect of, of broad, you know, broadly used herbicides and insecticides on the soil microbiome? Uh, that's a good question. And, and actually we're, we're, we're learning more about it uh, every year. Um, a lot of the, obviously, a lot of the fungicides that are, that are used are very detrimental to any mycorrhizae that, that is in the soil um, due to the fact that they're, that they are, um, you know, they're, they're fungi. And, um, you know, I did, I did, I've done a lot of pesticide fates and, and the old uh, fungicide called Benlate is very detrimental to mycorrhizae. In fact, they use that as if they wanted a control site with no mycorrhizae, they would flood the soil with benlate and it would be gone. Uh, the, a lot of uh, many other um, herbicides, um, uh, well, insecticides, probably the most um, uh, detrimental insecticides are the new ones, the neonicotinoids um, are very detrimental to beneficial soil insects and nematodes. It can have an effect on fungi as well. Um, herbicides, um, many of these can affect different components, um, uh, even, even 2,4-D that, that does, um, is degraded fairly quickly, can have an effect on, uh, on some of the uh, fungi and bacteria, but after a while it will eventually dissipate. Uh, if, if one needs to use Roundup, or um, glyphosate. I've done a lot of work with, with that particular chemical. Um, it can change the um, um, rhizosphere uh, micro, microbial, rhizosphere microbiome actually and, and uh, favor certain fungi. And some of those fungi can be um, disease agents causing root rot. And at the same time, it will knock out some of the beneficial bacteria that are producing antibiotics to keep those pathogens down. So I know there's always, there, there's always been this myth, I guess I call it a myth, that glyphosate, uh, once it's applied, it's, it's gone in, in just a matter of weeks. So, well, we're, we find that that is not true. You can, you can use uh, uh, Roundup in these cropping systems for many years and then quit. We have found that even after two to three years, we're still finding glyphosate, glyphosate in its major breakdown product in the soil at up to part per million concentrations. And the thing of it is with, with glyphosate, it may not affect many of the crop plants, but many of our native species that are small seeded uh, can be affected by small residual levels of glyphosate in the soil. And I think the same is true for some of these uh, turf grass uh, seeds as well. So you need to be kind of uh, uh, watch your management if you're going to use a lot of uh, Roundup because uh, uh, you may have some germination problems and you may have some soil health issues, uh, lower organic matter accumulation and that kind of thing. Thank you. Um, we have some questions about 
uh, the effect of invasive plants on the soil microbe. And I know you you and your colleagues uh, did a study about that, and we have a Missouri Prairie Journal article that you and your colleagues wrote about that. Um, and then sort of a second part to that is, um, of course, when we are the Missouri Prairie Foundation or, or other folks who own prairies, you know, we use herbicides in a very targeted manner to control invasive plants. So, um, you know, what's the effect of invasives on soil microbes? And then, as you said, some herbicides can have a residual effect, but is does controlling the invasives uh, sort of override, you know, the ch potential changes um, that can happen to the soil micro because of herbicides. And here, right. I'm, here I'm talking about not broad use, like as in a crop situation, but very targeted uh, use, you know, to control very specific invasives. Right. No, I no, I understand. Uh, yeah. Uh, right. We we did uh, we did the study on. Cerisa lespedes, and I know my colleague uh, Reed Smita has done some work with uh, bush honeysuckle, uh, and and it's it's very you know we find the same things that that um, you know with with those types of uh, invasives, if it's a really thick stand, there's nothing else that's growing in you know in in that site, and so you know your your uh, the challenge is well you know how do you control that how do you eradicate it, and most of the time you you have to resort to a as you say a spot application of these herbicides in order to get rid of them so you can begin uh, renovating uh, that site for uh, future grassland now some of those herbicides um, even though they're applied to the foliage will find their way into the soil because if they're systemic they'll they'll be released through the roots just like the photosynthate i was mentioning is released through roots and um, can that, that way contact the microbiome. Uh, it, you know, it, if it's, um, if the uh, control measure with herbicides is, is successful within a year or two, um, then you have a chance to perhaps overseed that with uh, some, some uh, whether it's native or non-native uh, plant species that can root very quickly uh, establish or begin establishing a resilient soil microbiome that might, that will include those that are able to degrade these synthetic chemicals. And that will give you a good start on eventually introducing those native species in there. That, that would be the way I would, I would look at it uh, in order to, uh, you know, kind of uh, remediate uh, the invasive site that has received these uh, chemicals. Thank you. Um, a couple of questions about how to improve the soil microbiome in a person's yard. Um, are there are there things that could be done? For example, um, uh, mowing up, you know, letting leaves stay where they are, uh, and that that can be beneficial for other reasons too. But in particular, with the soil microbe. Um, micro the soil microbiome um, or you know leaving organic matter or perhaps you know mowing leaves integrating you know leaf material into a lawn or um, would you recommend uh, a, an application of you know mycorrhizal fungi um, what are some what are your recommendations and and why would we want to do this in our yards or our gardens uh, yes um, well um, I would also recommend uh, uh, taking a soil test um, just to see what you got in there nutrient wise and especially uh, micronutrients. I, that's one of the things I didn't get to um, uh, micronutrients are, and I'm talking about things like uh, um, cobalt, copper, molybdenum, um, uh, manganese and this kind of thing because they are essential to many of the biological transformations because they activate the enzymes that the uh, microbes use to, let's say, break down some of these, some of these compounds um, in in this um, in these organic residues, such as leaves and grass clippings. And certainly, uh, I agree that that uh, leaving leaving grass clippings on the lawn 
uh, mulching in the, the leaves is a, is a good practice to build up your organic matter. You, you know, you, you really want good organic matter under your turf grass or, or your lawn vegetation, you know, basically for some of the uh, properties that I mentioned, you know, good, good infiltration, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, water infiltration, because higher soils with higher organic matter content will absorb considerably a lot more water than those that have very little. So, um, you know, it's, it's a win-win. You don't have to water the lawn as much if you're retaining more water. You don't have to worry too much about uh, erosion if you're if you got a lawn on a slope. So get that organic matter up there uh, for moisture holding capacity. Uh, also supporting the, the microbiome, which is going to cycle these nutrients to your plants. Now, if there's a if there's a difficult situation in trying to get this material to decompose in your in your grass, there are some substances that can be used. Um, I and I, I you know. Just simple, um, you know, if, if you, if you want to use a chemical, you can use a urea uh, spray or something like that because that will add nitrogen uh, to that material that will help the microbes break that down. The microbes need, you know, uh, they need N or nitrogen to break down this highly carbonaceous material, especially tree leaves that can be maybe uh, 60, 70, 80 percent carbon. So that or there are some biological products out there that can be used to stimulate the microbes to break these things down or um, that can help in beginning to um, the, the decomposition process of, uh, of those materials that can, um, in other words, uh, help get that into the soil. Um, you know, potentially maybe if you have an aerator that, that would help too to kind of help incorporate that into the soil. Uh, as well, uh, kind of get that soil um, organic residue contact and, and get the uh, get the decomposition pro uh, process going. Um, I think I answered that question fully, but let me know if I missed something. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, there. What about um, products that are available? Uh, Michael Reisel products. Oh yes. Uh, do you would you recommend any of those for say vegetable gardening or you know other other kinds of gardening? Uh, yes, um, it's especially uh, if you do a lot of intensive tillage in the in the garden. Um, that that is it, that is uh, generally somewhat detrimental to the mycorrhizae and, and other fungi in the soil because if you remember from some of the some of the uh, illustrations I showed you these are thread-like microorganisms and so tillage can kind of break them up and, and set them back on their on their uh, growth a bit so uh, using uh, mycorrhizal inoculations would be good but be sure you read the label because sometimes these mycorrhizae may be specific only for certain uh, certain plants, for instance, uh, blueberries and uh, the rhododendrons and azaleas and, and these kinds of plants have a completely different mycorrhizae than the arbuscular type mycorrhizae that you would use for most vegetable crops. So um, be sure and be sure you get the right kind. Um, there are some other biologicals that you might consider, but again, uh, do your research on that because some of them, are sold based on strictly testimonials and don't have a whole lot of research behind them. Um, I have researched probably 30 to 40 different types of biological products and, and I know there are some that are not as good as others. So uh, be aware of that. And now also some of those biological products are just simply biostimulants. In other words, they don't have the living organism in them, but they do have um, the stimulant compounds, the uh, the, the root stimulants, the uh, uh, plant growth hormones, or we call them regulators not now, such as the auxins and the cytokinins that can help the plant uh, uh, grow a little bit better and tolerate more stress, maybe even tolerate any insect attack as well. Thank you. Uh, there's a question about um, the perennial grains that are being grown and studied at the Land Institute in Kansas. The question, do you know if the carbon storage of those perennial grains has been studied? 
Uh, yes, that's a good question. I am not sure, but I but I do believe because of the fact that they do have a a research lab associated with the uh, Land Institute that they would be doing that. Um, it stands to reason. I'm sure you all, some of you anyway, have seen Wes Jackson's diagram of the of the deep rooted uh, kerns of plant. Um, it goes, you know, many feet into the soil that that it would be uh, depositing carbon and sequestering carbon uh, because it may be moving photosynthate to that to those depths and storing it because there's a lot there's there's a little less microbial ac activity at depth um, as well as the amount of root biomass that there is is very similar to the uh, profile that I showed of the Indian grass that amount of material is going to hold a lot of carbon so um, you know I'm, I'm speculating at this point but I I would suspect that they are looking into that and I do know for a fact that they do have some uh, USDA ag research service uh, people working with them um, to um, really get a complete picture of, of the functionality of this particular perennial crop. Thank you. I remember in um, an article that you wrote with your colleagues for the Missouri Prairie Journal, you mentioned about uh, research that has demonstrated that there's a correlation between diversity of plant species and diversity and abundance of soil microbes. Could you talk a bit about um, that correlation? Um, you know, it, 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 in fact, is if you have a, you know, for example, a very diverse prairie or prairie planting, will you then have a diversity of soil microbes? Um. Uh, yes, uh, that that is that is true. Um, one of the slides I didn't show that um, that um, I, I kind of omitted at the last minute. Maybe I should have put it in, left in there. But it was a it was a uh, uh, where we did some um, uh, microbial surveys on a, re, a restored prairie and compared it with uh, with a fescue pasture, which is pro which was primarily a, a monoculture. Of, of fescue, it might have had some orchard grass in it, and compared that with a uh, with a with a native grass system that had you know a lot of a lot of the different warm season grasses um, switched um, uh, the 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 uh, blue stem and uh, uh, eastern gamma eastern gamma grass. There may have been some switchgrass in there, and then then also some of the forbs like com compass grass or compass weed and and uh, uh, cone flower and these these kinds of, of plants, and the, uh, the diversity based on the different uh, difference different types of microbial groups we were getting were were at least uh, two to two and a half times the, the, the diversity that you saw in a cool season uh, fescue pasture. So that that was a good correlation there. And then some of the work that Kristen Beam and I were involved in with the uh, Southwest Prairies selected Southwest Prairies that, that the Prairie Foundation have and Tucker Prairie showed the same thing when we compared it to a uh, to a to a cultivated system or a cool season pasture that has something like fescue in it so you do see that and uh, uh, you know what what you see then is a lot more um, organic matter or act, active carbon uh, be, uh, because of that diversity, you, you have a much more um, complete functioning system in that than you do in a system where you just have a monoculture. Now, true, because fescue is a perennial, you do have uh, an active microbiome year round, but it may not have all the components to complete many of the uh, uh, different biological cycles that you would see in a in a native type grassland situation. Thank you. Then we have a question that kind of is, is looking at the, the, the converse. Have you found that weeds favor low soil biology? Oh yes, that's a, that's a good question. Um, it it <laughs> it depends. Um, you think many of our problem weeds um, are the type that do not associate with mycorrhizae. Um, the water hemp's and the pigweeds are a very good example of that. So are the, uh, 
um, lamb's quarter type, uh, the, kino, the kinopodium type uh, plants. Uh, they're like um, in the sugar beet family, which do not associate with mycorrhizae. So um, I did a survey some years ago on, on this very, on this similar question is, is what is, you know, escaped weeds and uh, herbicide resistant weeds in a field doing to the soil biology. And that is one of the things that, that can be affected is, is the fact that if you don't have a compatible uh, plant in there that's going to kind of host these mycorrhizae and, and kind of shepherd them along and let them produce spores so that your next beneficial crop that you plant in there are going to be infected, uh, you're going to have very low association of mycorrhizae with these plants. Um, also, uh, again, very similar to uh, what I mentioned about the, um, about the fescue is, is that uh, your, your uh, total uh, diversity will be reduced uh, by these weeds. Um, although in some cases we, do, we have found that, that weeds will, um, will also maintain a, a particular level of, uh, of, a, of microbiome diversity if that's all you have, you know, my, the, the, the whole craze about cover crops in agronomic systems now, you know, is to get those cover crops in there over the, over the season uh, in order to you know, maintain soil health. My position is, is if you have at least something growing on the ground, even if it's weeds, it's got to be beneficial, more beneficial than just bare ground. Uh, but, but again, most weeds, um, probably do not uh, support the extensive uh, microbial diversity that you would see in a, especially in a perennial diverse planted um, grassland or woodland for that matter. Thank you. Um, in, re in, re in, in terms of the soil microbiome, do you know specifically why grazing can be beneficial? Uh, yeah, there's been some work on that. Um, uh, first, um, it, grazing, uh, uh, clipping off the, the plants or, or some clippings in the plants will stimulate uh, root uh, growth or, or root pro proliferation. And when, and when you have that, that plant is going to explore more soil in the, uh, in the root zone. It's going to del deliver more uh, carbon substrate for the soil microbiome and build up more of the biological um, entity in, in the soil. So that's, that's, that's one situation. The other one is um, you have a little, you know, you have a little disturbance on that soil surface is kind of trampling in some of that residue that's in the soil. Plus the uh, plants that they are eating will, uh, will be <clears throat> deposited from the other end of the cow or, or whatever animal is get grazing there. And you have, you have deposition of this processed material across the landscape and it is it is perfect for uh, stimulating more microorganisms in the soil and uh, and really we've uh, we've we had a graduate student looking at these different uh, deposits across the soil I think one of them was in a prairie or at least a reconstructed prairie and, and there is a huge amount of microbial activity uh, right beneath one of the uh, big droppings of a cow um, and then it, it generally um, dissipates the further you get away from it. So uh, that, and then, then uh, finally, uh, the, the, the traffic of these cattle, as long as it, the, the area is not overstocked, uh, we found that in the hoof prints, uh, where a lot of people would expect a lot of the soil compaction, uh, there re really isn't that much of a compaction in these hoof prints. Obviously, if there's a cow path that is being used all the time, that's a different story. But it, at random uh, uh, traffic uh, across the landscape, there really isn't a lot of different that would difference that would um, that would affect uh, the overall uh, functionality of the uh, of the of the biology. Thank you. So the question, are there kits available commercially that can help us determine the microbial activity in the soil of gardens established with native plants? Um, yes, good question. At, at one time, uh, we were working on that to have something that was uh, 
friendly for the grower. Um, and one of them was this active carbon uh, assay that uh, is, should show you uh, how well your um, um, microbiome is functioning based on the amount of, of that that is being produced. But, but, we, but um, NRCS, the National Natural Resource Conservation Service, picked it up and they were, they were working on it, but they could never get it re to be repeatable enough in the field for growers to be confident in it. So that one, that one kind of hit a dead end. Now there are some, some other um, um, kits or, or instruments that can be used to monitor uh, soil mineralization, which would be that carbon mineralization that is the final step in decomposition of these organic materials in soil that are available. Um, uh, one of them is called um, Sol Vita uh, that can be used. They, they've made it to where they have a color-coded uh, reaction strip that will line up with a certain amount of mineralization rate of carbon. And obviously the higher the rate is, is supposedly related to microbial activity. Um, I think it has to be used carefully uh, and as long as it, you follow the guidelines, you should have a good idea on uh, microbial activity uh, using a system like that. I think there's some other, there are some other uh, kits that may measure other, other things, but I'm not, I haven't been current on that too much. I, I still have a kit that I bought from uh, Gemplers, which is a uh, kind of an outdoors thing, kind of like forestry supplies outfit and uh, in that kit uh, you know you can you can not only do the carbon mineralization but um, a lot of the standard soil tests like soil pH and, and you can do aggregate stability aggregate uh, measurements uh, water infiltration and uh, various other other things uh, uh, with it um, and at that time when I bought it, it was, uh, it was about $300. Uh, but now I, I priced one a while back. It's all the way up to $800 already. So I'm not sure many gardeners are going to put that investment into a, into a kit like that. But um, um, that's, that's, about, um, that's about as much as I'm familiar with at this point. Thank you. The next question, Bob, if you don't mind, I might answer it first, but then please do chime in. Um, question is, can prairie plants be mixed with, with crop plants? And uh, in, there is a, in fact, there's a, a, a grass, a um, conservation reserve program practice called prairie strips. The CP43 is the, the code. And it's a practice of, of planting strips of prairie vegetation within or around a, a, a soybean or, or corn field, uh, a minimum of 30 feet wide and as much as 120 feet wide. And these strips, uh, or this practice is primarily um, intended to uh, curb soil erosion, you know, to protect soil, to prevent runoff of agricultural fertilizers or chemicals, and also to slow and absorb stormwater, rainwater, to sort of act like speed bumps through a crop field. Um, so yes, it is possible in terms of these strips, um, but in terms of any other kind of integration, um, I, I'll, and, and how that affects the soil uh, microbiome, um, Bob, can you uh, provide any information? <clears throat> oh, to an extent. Um... But you know, I, you know, you you're right about the uh, the prairie strips, and I'm, you know, I I'm glad to hear that there's an incentive program to do that because uh, the, the the strips would um, um, work, you know, especially on on a uh, sloped landscape that uh, for every, for all the for all the purposes that that you mentioned. That's, so I think it's a good idea, and and also. Uh, uh, maintaining uh, pollinators and beneficial insects as well that might even uh, uh, move into the crop and, and prey on some uh, insect pests on, on corn and soybeans. Um, 
the uh, you know it's interesting a, a, a couple of weeks ago um, one of the guys from um, from the university and myself were visiting with a fellow in Montgomery County who had this area that that had um, just naturally reseeded two prairie plants uh, in in a cool season pasture he's you know he was getting ready to renovate it and then he just let it go for a couple of years and then he had all this you know big blue and and these uh, forbs and and uh, Indian grass coming in through there it, it kind of came from the native from a native seed bank into that into that system so that to me was kind of a mixed system because he also still had fescue and orchard grass in there and and his idea was well during the summer like at this time of year where it's very dry you know his cattle can benefit from the um from the warm season grasses because they are they're basically thriving right now and then later on you know in the from uh, late fall th through spring he'll have his cool season grasses while the uh warm season grasses are dormant and they can graze on that. So I thought that was pretty unique. Um, and, and he said he didn't, you know, he didn't want to, he didn't want to take out those cool season gra grasses. So uh, that is one of the sites that we did sample years ago that, that I had mentioned uh, previously about the difference between the microbiome diversity of a, of a, um, a native prairie system and a cool season monoculture such as fescue and, and the microbiome in that system with that mixed cool season grasses was was very high in fact it was it was higher when you when we consider the total um, microbial uh, um, compounds that we're using for fingerprinting the, the uh, microbial compound components in the soil was even ha higher than a remnant prairie that was over 80 years old that was down the road in, on the same on the same soil and landscape um, I, I, would, I would guess that another way to integrate uh, uh, these native plants into a, an agronomic system might be doing something that is known as strip tillage, where, where you, you could uh, strip till a, say, a six to eight inch strip, and then leave uh, maybe uh, 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 an 18 inch strip of grass and then planting into that tilled strip and, and, um, and then growing your crop along with the native uh, plants. I know they do that for um, other, other cool season systems. Uh, that could be a possibility and, and it, may be, it may be in practice now, but I haven't seen a, a whole lot about that. Um, and then I'll finally end on, on a system that we've been looking at. It's called a, um, integrated cropping system where we grow we grow corn and then on 60 inch rows and then on that middle uh, row that 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 is blank we've been putting in um, inner crops uh, native plants could work for that and that would be a way to maybe eventually renovate a site you know getting it to prairie grasses or just using it as a means of uh, maintaining um, um, your soil uh, integrity, much in the same way that you use these uh, wider uh, prairie strips. Thank you, Bob. Uh, real quickly, we had a question. Um, could you repeat the name of that soil kit? I thought you said soil vita, but I was not sure. Oh, soil vita. It's S O L V I T A. Okay, very good. Thank you. And um, there's a question about um, the soil food web diagram that you used. In your presentation, um, Eileen says she'd like to follow up on the article in Trends in Microbiology. Could you give the title or author? And you can um, maybe just email it to me and we can put it in the chat or in the email that we send out tomorrow. Yeah, I, I could send that to you. Um, otherwise, well, I guess I can't back up. But uh, um, uh, yeah, I, I'd be glad to do that. Okay, thanks. And we'll put that in the email tomorrow. And a um, question about jumping worms. What effect do jumping worms have on our soil systems? How great a threat are they? Um, I, I believe if I understand it, these are the invasive non-native uh, earthworms. Is that right? 
Well, it, <laughs> I'm not familiar with the term jumping worms. I, I think that's what they are. And, and if, if that's what they are, um, they, um, they're detrimental, especially in forest systems, because apparently what, what can happen if, you, if there's enough of them uh, in, the, uh, in the soil, uh, in, the, in their biomass, they can completely destroy the litter layer on the surface of the soil. And uh, because that they, they will ingest it so much and begin decomposing it. But the problem is, is that if, uh, um, you know, if you're destroying the litter layer in a, in a woodland situation and there's really not a whole lot of other cover, uh, that could lead to a pretty bad situation of erosion, um, uh, poor water retention and, and that kind of thing. So um, perhaps that would be a problem in um, agronomic situations as well. I'm not sure how that might work in a grassland situation. I really haven't come across that, but, you know, I think it's certainly it's something that can be, or that should be uh, uh, something to be aware of. And um, um, uh, that's, you know, that's about the best I can answer that for at this time. Thank you, Bob. And I see that this is this soil food web is from trends in biotechnology. Right. I'll get a more complete um, uh, reference for you tomorrow. I'm sure I've got that uh, in my files somewhere. Thank you. And in the chat, um, folks have have uh, have or to to the hosts and panelists have said that the Asian jumping worm uh, it, uh, so, so yeah, I, I knew about the invasive earthworms. I didn't realize they were referred to as jumping worms. So um, that is uh, good to know. And, uh, but I wonder if there's anything that can be done uh, because <laughs> trying to control these invasive worms might be detrimental to, to native uh, soil organisms. Uh, yeah, I agree. It, it could be very competitive. Um, obviously, if they can uh, destroy a little layer in, in um, a short amount of time. Uh, I think in um, Wisconsin or Minnesota that, that they are setting up some sort of uh, barrier or, uh, or other type of um, defense against these worms because apparently they are moving north at a fairly good clip. Uh, so um, I, I imagine that we, we just, we're just going to have to research that and see what, what's being done in, uh, in, those, in those areas. Thank you. And with the time that we have left, we have just two more questions and they're related. Um, in the first one, Stan asks, does size matter regarding attempts to recreate prairie? I, I'm assuming he means in terms of soil microbiome. Is there a minimal acreage that makes the effort cost effective and or ecologically beneficial? Um, I don't with my experience, I don't think that there would be a minimum. Uh, for instance, I worked with uh, Linda Hessel at uh, Prey Birthday Farm, and we were use, we were looking in fairly small, uh, you know, fairly fairly small areas. Uh, for instance, her uh, reconstructed prairie is on a site that is probably not much more than you know an acre and a half, maybe two acres at the most, and uh, that. You know, you got to understand that that was a, you know, maybe stands starting with something that's already been in, in some, in some under good management, but this particular site was really degraded. It had less than two inches of topsoil at the outset, and it was all in fescue and it was highly eroded. And um, just the fact that, that she was willing to remediate that and get those prairie plants established. Um, you know, within, it took some time. I think she started in about the mid nineties to get this going. And I got involved around 2001 or so, uh, you know, and I didn't show the, 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 uh, the microbial uh, breakdown for, for her site, but it was quite impressive. The um, um, amount of diversity that, that she got, you know, and it took, you know, it took, 10 to 15 years. I mean, you got to understand it just, it just takes time. Some folks think you can increase organic matter, you know, one to 2% in one year, which, which is, you know, just does, just goes against 
uh, logic, um, actually. But but over time, it will it will it will turn up. So you, I think in a in a restoration effort, um, <clears throat> you know, I starting on a, on a on a small si situation like that. Um, uh, plus, she also integrated prairie plants in with her orchard, which I thought was a very innovative idea. Um, the, uh, my, the microbial measurements there are, are way off the charts compared to grass, you know, cool season glass that is adjacent to her property. Um, so, you know, I don't think uh, area wise that size will matter um, unless, you know, you're going to go into it in a big way and, and and your expectations are high, um, you know, um, <clears throat> it, it might, it might, uh, it might be disappointing for a few years, but uh, um, <clears throat> I think um, with some of the, some of the management practices that is often uh, uh, publicized in the Missouri Prairie Journal for one uh, is, is effective and, and and whether the, the intention was to improve soil health or the soil biology uh, or not, uh, those practices uh, are often uh, beneficial uh, for that in, in, in uh, you know, regardless. Thank you. And the last question, because um, I know you need to leave at 5.30, is what would you recommend as the preferred way to get rid of a small test patch of old pasture, approximately 10 by 10 feet, to convert to prairie planting? Would you herbicide, till, or burn? It's really, um, you know, what you want to do. Um, if, you, if, if, you don't, um, if you don't mind uh, using chemicals, that would probably be the quickest and most efficient way to go. Just be aware that there may be some carryover. Uh, and uh, for some of the small seeded, um, uh, natives, there might be some uh, uh, detrimental effect on those once you get this get it established. Um, especially if you're, you know, if you're going to use something like no-till or just broadcast it without disturbing the soil. Um, if, if you want to use tillage, I think, I think probably the the most um, uh, um, efficient way, if you don't want to be hassled with the amount of vegetation on there is to really clip that very close to the soil surface um, or, you know, graze it very heavily. Of course, yes, it's a 10 by 10. That's probably not, <laughs> that's probably not logical, but, but you want to, you know, clip it very close to the soil surface and then, and then till it up um, would, would be, would be okay. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of leaning towards a, uh, combination of, of systems maybe uh you know clipping it off real real closely uh allowing it to grow maybe and then burn it off in the spring or something like that and really just keep just keep that vegetation down um in you know intercede that um, uh, those those prairie uh, plants and let them get a head start on on those other on, on the original vegetation that you have there, if, that, if that's possible. But um, um, I think there's a lot of ways with, with that type of, uh, uh, that size of site, I, I would look at maybe using one or more ways of, of, uh, of renovating it and getting that, uh, those plants established. Thank you, Bob. And, and I'll just add to, um, when the Prairie Foundation does reconstructions, of course, we're usually looking at a bigger size than that. Um, we don't do tilling because we don't want to disrupt the soil uh, aggregate. And also, it just brings up so many different weeds. And you can't, we, we find that you can't really kill fescue uh, with tilling alone. Um, but so we do use herbicide or uh, to prepare an area, or we might um, we'll do that and then do a year of uh, no-till soybeans to prepare the site. But for a 10 by 10 area, another thing you could do is simply place uh, cardboard down if you don't want to use herbicide and you can cover that with mulch and keep it in place for a couple of months to kill that vegetation. Although I don't know what that would do to the soil microbiome <laughs> that might heat it up so much. So um, I don't know about that, but um, we are out of time, but we will 
um, send a number of um, links in the email tomorrow, including some links to Prairie Planting Establishment um, and links to a number of articles that um, Bob has written and his colleagues have written for us, including work that he did um, with Linda Hetzel at Prairie Birthday Farm. So thank you all very much for joining us today and do um, watch our e-news website, social media for upcoming webinars. We've got a lot of great webinars and masterclasses coming up. And Bob, thank you very much for sharing your expertise and preparing and delivering such a wonderful presentation for us. Well, uh, thank you, Carol. I was uh, glad to do it. Good night, everyone. <laughs>